Welcome to Arx Chat. I'm John Robinette, one of your hosts, along with Robin Bauer Kilgo and Amanda Robinson. For this episode, we welcome two members of the Getty Conservation Institute, Joel Taylor and Caitlin Spangler Bickle, uh, to discuss with us their current uh, research into climate conditions and specifically as they pertain to uh, our loan contracts and all of our requirements uh, regarding the regarding uh, climate conditions uh, when we do uh, make a loan request. So uh, without uh, any further delay, let's go ahead and uh, get right to the topic. Um, the first thing, you know, we all really want to know is uh, how, uh, what, what exactly are you researching uh, when we talk about these things? And what is your MCE initiative? Okay, um, yeah, just to start with the, the initiative, um, it's the Managing Collection Environments Initiative, uh, which has been going on, um, gathering pace since about 2013. Uh, and this is really um, a cluster of projects which are all intended to examine how we can manage our collection environments more holistically. Um, so this is really thinking about temperature and relative humidity um, and examining approaches, uh, looking at uh, training, research, uh, field studies, uh, and guidance, which all contribute to a broader concept, a more sustainable approach to um, collection preservation. Fantastic. So. And so how does this project uh, work uh, within that, that construct? Well, there are a number of different aspects to it. As I said, it's been going on for a little while. Um, when the, the project was initiated, it was, it was during quite a quite fierce adversarial debate about climates, about what we should be considering, uh, how this related to kind of sustainable approaches to, um, to preservation. And a lot of that is connected to the numbers, those specifications. It was around the time, it was just before um, the International Institute for Conservation uh, and the International ICOMCC, the International Council of Museums Committee for Conservation, collaborated on uh, guidance for environmental standards for loans in the conservation world. Uh, and it was really kind of part of it, it was connected to a debate whether we should have tight or relaxed numbers but what we're trying to do is step back a little bit with this aspect of the project when we're looking at loans it's never really been a gray area um, it's never been a black and white it's always been a gray area most i'm sorry um, and to actually try and understand the the processes around this the, the context in which we make decisions um, and there are also elements of this because uh, guidance is changing because practices are changing because uh, research is continuing uh, all of these are moving parts uh, and occasionally there can be a kind of a discrepancy between what's happening on the ground and what's happening in policy or where the research is going but they're all very intimately connected the, the way the research is going the questions that we ask are often based on on the practice and, and how things work the, the kinds of policies that we feel we're able to to develop, uh, depend on the knowledge and the research we have and what we feel we can accomplish. Um, so kind of how, the, how these things align is a very important background aspect to how we, how we perceive loans. And to me, it's, it's always been the, the, big, the big issue, uh, which there's a lot written about how to do loans. There's a lot written about the, the problems and the connections of um, it, to do with environmental standards and guidelines and agreements. Um, but there hasn't been so much that really examines that process from all angles, from different disciplines. Uh, so we, I mean, I'm, I'm a conservative by background. So conservatives and conservation scientists, we talk about in a certain way. Um, but that doesn't necessarily include allied professionals. It hasn't always included registrars, collection managers, hasn't always included facilities managers. Uh, and I think this is kind of something that we, we feel needs to, to be addressed um, to, uh, in context of, of what we're doing. So essentially you're, um, you're investigating the current often widely accepted and distributed uh, climate standards 
that appear in loan contracts and and just asking questions as to is this should this remain the way this is is this process sound are these climate standards uh sound is this is this a, pr a practice that should continue is is that I mean, correct I mean, that's definitely part of it i mean what we're trying to do with the whole initiative i mean is to get a better understanding of how materials behave in changing climates um but it's also um it's not to then try and pick a set of numbers because there isn't a one-size-fits-all number that we um that anyone can really provide but it's developing ways in which people can use a more evidence-based approach to their collection preservation not just uh, loans but also in their storage and their display but they're also connected um, uh, and people start to think about these things but what are the contextual factors and a lot of this is not new information with it's not just us researching alone you know there are a lot of a lot of people doing this and a lot of information has been out there for a very long time so some of it is just stepping back a little bit uh, and trying to to return to things that we've known for for a little while, and to make that more accessible to to more people. I see. And um, how did you come to get interested in this topic? Um, shall I go? Shall I go first, Caitlin? Or, um, I think. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm I'm a, a preventive conservator, I guess. So it's um, kind of climate has always been an interest to me um, and this so kind of when the MCE project started I was I was very excited about that um, and I think for, for me the kind of like if you're talking specifically about kind of looking at loans it was something where I started to see that this is this is a big crucial aspect that a lot of the policies refer to this stuff there's a lot of research about material properties but there seems to be this kind of this this element this kind of non-technical element and this was a time when it became, the, the debates were very adversarial between relaxed and tight specifications. And it seemed to be these different camps uh, which were opposing one another. Uh, and and who are these camps, to be specific? Okay, sure. Um, well, I think, I mean, a lot of that is in conservation science um, on both sides. But also, I mean, it, we can't really... I mean, tell the story without mentioning uh, the, the Bezo group had a declaration of um, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and that was saying that I think we think that the, the general default standard should be 40 to 60. Uh, and then there's a National Museum Directors Conference uh, 2009, which uh, connected to this. There's also been changing standards um, and guidance within the conservation field, certainly guidance. There was um, some quite stringent standards maybe 20 years ago um, which were applied and that was always plus minus five um, but a lot of the recent guidance um, has tended to uh, broaden that out try to introduce context try to introduce uh, things like the material properties so 50 isn't necessarily all that fantastic for archives for example cold and dry is often more suitable so trying to to take some of this knowledge uh and look at some of that tension at the same time uh as a reaction to that kind of broadening there were there were camps of people conservation scientists conservators who felt that this was quite cavalier uh that we knew that 55 plus minus 5 or 50 plus minus 5 worked so why why rock the boat um so and that's then, to clarify percentage of uh, relative humidity that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're so into it that we uh, we kind of start to think about. It. Um, so so when we're when we're thinking specifically about relative humidity fluctuation, uh, then it became one of these things where we, um, depending on the perspective uh, and and how things work, if a museum has fifty five plus minus five percent relative humidity or fifty plus minus five it seems quite daunting to them to then change that and then to to loan an object to something which is different from that um it sends things into the unknown a little bit um and there isn't that much known about behavior because these objects are not uh brand new uh because they're often unique in different ways we can't turn to material science uh for everything and to to find out what these properties are so um so there's kind of so there's a, a lot that we don't know. We'll never know it all. Um, so it's, it's partly 
how pragmatic people are willing to be. Um, and there are various different sides to that argument, but, um, but it's ended up often being a kind of between these, these kind of breadth and, and tightness kind of relationships. Caitlin, do you have uh, something to add to that in terms well, of how um, you got interested? Yeah, sure. I, I can um, give my background and my role in the project. So I am not a conservator. I am actually an anthropologist who has somehow infiltrated the Getty Conservation Institute. Um, well done. <laughs> thank you. So uh, my role in this actually is to help take an anthropological lens on the processes of loans and how they work in practice. So um, this is something that I have been doing in, during my PhD research with the research network NACA, New Approaches in the Conservation of Contemporary Art. That group has started to adopt anthropological research methods, um, such as participant observation and interviews to try and understand the complexities of caring for a lot of contemporary artworks. Um, and so that's sort of, I've. I've moved over into the world of loans here with the Managing Collection Environments Initiative because the MCE initiative has their scientific and technical studies to try and understand material response to climatic changes in the environment. But a collection environment is not just about temperature and relative humidity. The environment, the greater environment that in which a collection lives is, is the museum, right? So it's, it's the institution and the people working there. So trying to better understand how those environments affect these objects and the well-being of those objects. So in order to investigate the decision-making processes for loans, uh, I've come on to try and interview um, as many different people as possible, perspectives as possible, to understand where there might be some fault lines, miscommunications, misperceptions, but also where there are confluences in where things work well um, to try and understand the loans landscape and how that differs from institution to institution in terms of type or size. Um, and to try and understand what are the issues in practice as opposed to sort of assuming already, you know, these are the problems that we need to try and solve, but to, to try and take a step back and see, well, is temperature and relative humidity really an issue? Are people encountering difficulties um, with this standard or that standard or this guidance or that guidance? So it's really building it from the ground up. And that was, a, that was quite an important thing for, for us um, because it was Kaylin's background in anthropology, which was, which was interesting because I'm a conservator, I come from that world. And I didn't want this to be a project where it was conservators telling the rest of the world what they thought should happen or tell people oh well this is this is how you should be doing it from now on this is the this is the conserve, conservation approach uh but for it to be something which is kind of uh a more uh so instead of us just saying here are the new numbers you're welcome um for it to be something which is is quite interesting and i remember i mean before before i, I met caitlin i was kind of just trying to get a sense of, of, of what people are doing. I, I sat down, I, um, I met with um, various conservators and registrars in, in different places. There was one, there was one place that I got, and this is when I started to think this is, this is interesting, this is an important to study. I sat down with the, the head of conservation and the head registrar of, a, of an institution. Um, and they, I said, oh, I want to talk about, talk about loans and, and specifications and, and temperature and humidity. Um, then the, the conservator went off to, to do something, and then the, the registrar leaned over and said, I'm, I'm actually quite, I'm quite cool about these things. You know, I'm quite with the, the kind of the broad guidelines, but, but she's actually very, she's very narrow. She likes the plus minus five uh, RH. Then he went off to make a cup of tea. Uh, she came back uh, and then leaned over and said, just so you know, I'm actually pretty cool about the, these broad kind of specifications, but he's actually quite uh, kind of into the plus minus five, and kind of very, very rigid uh, about these things. And it was kind of like immediately before I'd even asked him anything, there was this kind of this thing going on, uh, two very intelligent, very uh, committed professionals who 
understood a lot of, of what was going on, but they didn't necessarily feel they were in a position to act upon it in that way. Um, and, you know, and, you know, highly, highly functional, very impressive people. Uh, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a, an opportunity to, to examine this further a little bit. Instead of kind of launching in with uh, this is what you should be thinking about to actually step back and, and understand because maybe the, the reasons why things are happening are not necessarily the things that are written about in conservation articles or uh, in, in conferences. Right. Are you suggesting that there's any dishonesty <laughs> uh, about all uh, of this? I mean, I, th I think, I, well, I guess, I mean, what you're referring to is um, uh, quite an iconic paper in, in the conservation world. Um, is that correct? Or are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Right. No, no, just um, because we're not, I mean, it's, uh, but yeah, there was uh, in 1994, there was a landmark uh, conference. Uh, on preventive conservation, and that was really when preventive conservation became a discipline right. in its own right. Uh, and there was a paper by John Isaac Smith, uh, Mick Omni, and David Ford, which looked at this, uh, and it kind of examined some of the things that actually happened. Uh, these were these were people in a in a big institution in, in the UK who had had experience with this and how how that works. So. Um, so there's people saying that, uh, I mean, but there's also the fact that you don't always get the opportunity to be dishonest. Um, so they talked about the fact that when you're measuring relative humidity, um, yeah. certainly at the time and still to a certain extent, it's probably plus or minus three accuracy. So if you've got two sensors, which are both plus or minus three, you could be 6% out in measuring relative humidity in the same in the same room in the same space in the same uh, uh, display case, uh, so all of a sudden, the extent to which we can say that we can meet these things is already quite difficult. But um, but yeah, the, but there are I mean in, in the paper it's uh, it's definitely worth a read. Uh, and you know we we I gave a presentation about this um, a couple of years ago, and I said what what they said is still relevant now. It would still be kind of a publisher of all paper now um, because there's it's, it's quite a lot of, of food for thought there and um, I know a, a number of different aspects of, of why people do it some people will say something in order to get a loan uh, and that was something they said that they'd identified but um, but it's also just the extent to which you can actually say that these things are are achieved um, it's it's you know part of part of part of that yeah right Okay, and I don't know what you want to say. Yeah, I think that, that that paper and the idea of dishonesty, whether it's intentional or not, so as, as Joel was saying, um, it can be unintentional in the way you're measuring these things and where the results are skewed and the numbers that you're communicating are, are skewed unintentionally or maybe intentionally, um, but also sort of turning a blind eye to someone who cannot meet certain environmental requirements, but knowing that the objects will be fine Therefore, every, it's a win-win for everyone, but sort of entering in these contracts which say one thing will happen and it doesn't. Um, so they were speaking about those kind of issues and it really is a lot about trust from, from the lending and the borrowing institution. How much do they trust each other and what is that relationship like? How is it characterized? So in this project, um, as we interview more and more people, and again, we're only at the beginning stages, but um, the more people we interview, we'd like to see to what extent these are still concerns that people have. Are people worried about whether borrowers are, are meeting the requirements that they've requested? Or um, are people worried about being able themselves to meet certain requirements? Uh, it may be the case that it's the same as it was in 1994 and, and a lot of quote unquote dishonesty is, is happening. Or it may be that things have changed a lot um, and there is a lot more trust and uh, more flexibility, but either way, we'd, we'd sort of like to know the reasons behind that and how institutions have changed and professions have changed. So we're trying, in a sense, we're trying to measure. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of that isn't necessarily, I mean, as Kenneth said, not people necessarily trying to be dishonest or, or seeking them, but it's just there's a lot of 
process and architecture that goes into every decision, goes into every negotiation. Um, uh, and this is the kind of the, the processes that go through um, the kind of uh, default uh, settings for, for something, uh, the, the different ways in which that every decision we make is, is influenced by things which we may not see as relevant. Um, but have a, a big impact on this. And it's kind of like, uh, for example, um, uh, where kind of when we were in the early stages of discussing this, um, I was using the, this analogy of uh, behavioral economics. Um, so, you know, when, uh, when you're buying, uh, you're, you're, you go to the, to, to the grocery store and then you're at the checkout and there are the sweeties or the, uh, the candy by the, the cash register. Uh, and then all of a sudden that's there because it's something which is to, to catch your eye at an impulse purchase. It's the same price as where it is elsewhere in the store, but, um, but all of a sudden it kind of, it influences your decision in a certain way. I used to live in Norway uh, where they have carrots and sugar snap peas by the cash register because they wanted to kind of create an environment where, um, where healthier choices are made because, because of, of that kind of impulse. And it's not necessarily something where you'd say rationally, this is, um, this is going to have a big impact. Um, but it's just a lot of the, the surroundings we have. And not to say that people are trying to shape that, but whether or not they are, that kind of, that architecture exists, that landscape exists. Any decision is made in a context. Uh, and it can be so pervasive, uh, so much the default, that it's very difficult to see it when you're in the middle. Uh, so being able to step back uh, and see what that landscape is uh, can actually be quite fruitful in terms of understanding where numbers come from, how numbers are negotiated, where that kind of process works, who, for whom it works, does it work for everyone and to the same extent, um, how that changes. Because also one of the, the interesting things is this isn't about an institution, this isn't uh, this is quite an unusual matter and that it's not something where an, inc an institution can resolve it themselves. Uh, but this is by definition something which is a discussion, uh, a, uh, a negotiation between at least two institutions. Uh, and that's really the process we're doing. So it's not kind of the individual person or how the, the institution performs or communicates, uh, but it's the, the professional culture that is the, the landscape by which all of these decisions are made. Right. And I, I would think that in many cases, a lot of times it's just because it's always been that way. You know, the contract says this, you know, and that's, that's why we're continuing with this. And of course, yeah, of course, our institution, we're a legitimate museum. Of course we can maintain these standards. Um, and it's, it's also, assumed. I mean, yeah. so some people, it's, it was there before they arrived. Uh, and also people are exceptionally busy. So to actually say, let's stop everything and then sit down and, and review these standards, and I'm not entirely sure why, or well, they're not necessarily standards, but these, these agreements. But there has to be the, the desire to do that as well. Because it can, it, and it's, there are various points at which that makes case. And it may be something where people don't feel they have the urge to do that. Uh, and this is a, an element of, you know, pe people thinking, well, no, I get it. And I, and I talk about these things. And I've, I've spoken to, I'm not registrar so much, but kind of program managers and exhibition coordinators. And I say, yeah, yeah, we've heard all that, that stuff, all that debate. But, you know, this, we've got other things to think about as well. So it's, it's that kind of thing where, because it's, it's quite a complex situation that involves, you know, you may change what's happening in your institution, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the institution is with whom you're, you're dealing uh, with an exhibition or with, a, the kind of, with whom you have a relationship, they feel the same way. So, um, so it's, it's a, quite a layered issue. It's quite, it's quite complex in that way. I, think. I was just thinking how, oh, go ahead, Amanda. No, it's okay, Robin, say what you have to say. I was just thinking how timely this conversation is with everyone kind of sitting there like with theoretical spare time on their hands of being able to look through the language of their loan contracts and their standards and kind of say like, is this stuff we really should be um, doing, or is there other reasons for it? Because I know there are people who are going to be searching for kind of work to do at a certain point. Yeah, yeah. So, and, I think, and this is the this is the great thing because I think I mean, and Kate, Caitlin, you might want to jump in here, but 
you know, we've been looking at um, research for, um, um, but we, and we were looking at publications from a number of different places, policies, uh, agreements. It's very rare, even in standards, official standards, guidance, you see it more, but rare to see the sources of why they've chosen the numbers they have. E even in a kind of uh, a, a big standard for, a, for a, uh, a whole process, it may not be something. There may be a few references to, to certain things, but it's, it's not that common. So then, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish with MC in general, with our training, with uh, some of our researchers, is not to, to pick certain numbers, but to provide opportunities for people to, to step back uh, and look at the evidence base for what they're doing uh, and then have a healthy review. And then, you know, there'll be, there'll be different, different agreements and different takes from different places, different parts of the world where they have different climate zones, you know, uh, and we're starting to see that taking place in, in countries. But if you're in Malaysia, where you know the average relative humidity is of seventy to eighty percent, that's me. You know, it's you know there, there's there's good reason to to start kind of questioning these things and trying to to see if that's if that's helpful. If there's a an H factor like an air conditioning system in the museum, or if it's in a historic house, uh, then you know, there's, there are people are openly question, and you know, I mean, you've probably surmised I'm from Europe. Um, you know, some some folks are kind of are doing that already to some extent because they said, well, you know, we just can't meet this, and putting in air conditioning for our historic house won't improve the climate because yeah. the, the the air exchange is, is too high for it to, to really work. Yeah. And, you know, well, I was just going to add that, like, living here in South Florida, our struggle is always humidity, right? And people are always after us to get that, that they want it to do the 50%. And there's, like, what, two times in the year, maybe? I don't think, actually, where I live in Florida, the humidity is ever at that level. You know what I mean? Just because I'm in the tropics. I think so, the USA has uh, quite a startling range mm -hmm. of climates. Kind of Alaska, yeah. uh, Florida, Hawaii, kind of mm -hmm. East Coast, West Coast. It's, it's pretty it's got something for everyone really um, <laughs> so it's so it's one of these things where there is there is a reason to say oh well let's let's have a look at this you know is, is this working for us you know how much energy are we spending to to get this thing uh and you know we we know what's possible uh but we don't always know what's necessary mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually where a lot of our standards come from um, so when we kind of look back at that kind of 50, 55 plus minus five RH, um, that didn't necessarily come from someone saying, this is when objects start to crack. Um, there is a kind of like a, a small class of very sensitive objects or objects that respond very quickly. But a lot of that is to do with what the best available technology could manage. Uh, so in the eighties, uh, there was a very kind of thoughtful, uh, approach to doing this and saying, oh, I'm in a. I'm in a temperate climate. I've got paintings and panel paintings. I'm in a big, heavy building with uh, an H, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, so you know we can we can do plus minus five, and we know that variation and fluctuation in, in relative humidity is not a good thing. So we'll go for that. So it's, it was informed largely by technological possibility uh, before the advent of air conditioning, um, the, the guidance was different. And also they actually did, the advent of air conditioning did another thing where then there was a target number, a set point because there'd be a thermostat or a humidistat. And then it was like, so you have to pick this number and then all of a sudden when it wasn't at that particular number, it may not be such a bad thing, but it would always be hunting that to reach that number again. Uh, so all of a sudden there was this way in which we expressed ourselves uh it affected the questions we asked uh about uh material change and, and preservation um so a lot of the the standards that we look at they also come from a context there's also a landscape uh which derived uh the numbers that we see even though even the more recent ones the the kind of the trend towards that kind of 40 65 40 60 came when people started to acknowledge sustainability and energy consumption as a big issue. So the IIC, ICOM CC um, guidelines that I mentioned earlier, they explicitly refer to environmental sustainability in, in those guidelines. Uh, in the 
the Association of uh, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, they recently kind of revised uh, their chapter. That kind of had more um, emphasis on sustainability and sustainable approaches, and more flexible ways in which people could uh, manage their their collection environments. So. A lot of these things come come with a background, uh, come with a context, uh, and being able to step back and just see what that context is can be incredibly helpful uh, to all to all people, registrars, conservators, facilities managers, directors. I think that um, you know, with the pervasiveness of our current standards, uh, you know, specifically, you know, seventy degrees, fifty percent uh, relative humidity. Um, that you know in order to fully create a new standard or a new situation in which we consider these these uh we we reevaluate our standards like i it seems like we would need some sort of a, a guideline some sort of a rule book an algorithm to <laughs> to tell us how to uh, amend our our loan contracts i mean I don't know that that's exactly what you're doing, but um, but it seems like from our point of view, uh, yeah. that's what we, we would want. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are two. Sorry, Caitlin, I'll, um, I just wanted to jump in a little bit because there are two things. That one, one uh, kind of just kind of uh, broad issue I want to say because in those loan agreements, they're not they're not standards per se. A lot of what we talk about aren't standards. The 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 numbers I was coming up with before and the the kind of the, the process that was gone through to get to 50, 55 plus minus five, that was in, that was in a, a textbook. Uh, it became like a de facto standard, but that became the guidance that people use. Uh, and that was therefore the thing that got quoted. So when we talk about industry standards, it's actually a very informal way. There is uh, a lot of the work out there will be referred to as a guideline or a, um, just a, a guidance in these ways. There's no kind of hard and fast element to this. Um, so then kind of, I say, it sounds like a pedantic point, but it's, it's quite important because then we start to see, oh, well, that author is writing it to, to, to be helpful in that context. These, these, um, these works were written with that particular context in mind. And no one is saying there's this hard and fast element to these things. Um, so, but when we start to look at that, we can start to see a sea change, which is happening, it's certainly happening in, in conservation. Uh, as I mentioned, um, with the, uh, the uh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, actually, uh, that has a guidance, that has kind of like a tier system of, of guidance. So if you're in a, a, specific, a specific institution, you might be able to reach certain things, but also it starts to say kind of more plus minus 10 or seasonal fluctuation. And there's actually a kind of a process by which you can look, there's a table in there by which you can start to say, uh, where do you look? And the starting point of that is the historic annual average of that collection. So if you're monitoring already, if you've got a year of data, then you can say, well, this is what my collection is. Uh, and this is kind of an important kind of rediscovery to a certain extent, but this is something which, um, draws on lived experience, uh, which you can start to see, which is what's happening with my, with my stuff. Um, if an object has gone through large things in large humidity, it can probably have those again. It can pro it's, it's shown that it can, it can survive those. If it cracked, then that crack will start to expand and contract. Uh, so then the stresses and strains that are undergone uh, through uh, variation in relative humidity are released by that, by that crack. Uh, so to a certain extent, um, and there are standards out there, there's one uh, EN15757-2010. Um, well done. I was again, <laughs> thank you very much. Someone fact uh, check that. that. <laughs> <laughs> On it. <laughs> um, but, uh, that actually looks at the kind of like a moving historical average of every three months. So then you're saying, if something has been doing this thing, uh, you can actually define a starting point in that way by basically what your collection has been ongoing. And that's not necessarily what your collection is made of, uh, but this is just what is, what is happening to it now? What, what is it undergoing? Because if you're lending it to a different institution, 
what 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 is happening to it now is a, is a reasonable starting point for, for where it might go in the future um and then looking at the, the kind of climatic zone uh what kind of institution you have if you have a historic house or uh, um something then you may want to be there uh and then actually having the opportunity to to move around and then you understand where the danger zones are and then you understand the levels of risk uh that take place and it's that kind of risk-based approach which is um becoming more pervasive so there was a, a publicly accessible specification uh which kind of started to outline the gray areas of these things uh to start to say i think some of that needed some some expertise um to to actually pick something but it was a, a really kind of breaking ground in terms of identifying that it's not a black and white issue and identifying that you can start to connect it to your context um, in Australia, uh, the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials uh, ratified about a year ago um, some new climate uh, standards, and that was for two climate regions because uh, Australia has temperate, subtropical, and tropical climates. Uh, so they have different specifications uh, for those for those different climates, uh, and that was something which was uh, connected to kind of looking back um that was uh, also connected to to work where people have been been looking at this a long time ago and kind of rediscovering things which have been happening before air conditioning was such a, a pervasive influence so th there's there's old stuff out there and a lot of the the ways things are turning that that um publicly accessible specification is now a, a standard uh, uh a european norm um so we're starting to see it appear in different places that kind of guidance um the mce program we do training courses to help people kind of set about these things and again it's one of these things where we're not trying to tell people what numbers they should have but to give people the opportunity to to review what they're doing uh and to um, to, to think about what is the best course of action for them uh, and what is what is the most holistic uh, approach um, that, that works for them, uh, how the sustainability kind of manifests itself in, in those different institutions. So I think, you know, that, that guidance is coming and one of these things that is, is, is taking place to a certain extent in, in the conservation, conservation side, science world. And I think it would be great for, for registrars and collections managers to be included in that more. Right. So Which we should be probably, in yeah. discussions with um with our conservators or people that we're dealing with on a more regular basis and being open about maybe reconsidering our, our practices. Yeah. You know. And w w whatever your outcome is, just that it's very, very healthy to, to reconsider that and involve different people uh, in the, in those reconsiderations. Yeah. I just want to add here as well, um, we're not only speaking to conservators and registrars, as John mentioned, also um, to exhibitions managers and facilities people, but um, even to insurance brokers and underwriters who have a large role in, in loan agreements and these processes. And um, there too, we've seen this, this issue crop up of access pipelines to up-to-date research and guidance. Um, you know, there can be all sorts of sources advising lenders and, and borrowers, even lawyers. You know, we've heard that sometimes lawyers advise a private collector on environmental conditions. And, you know, in, within all of this, um, there is never a communication of where those, those numbers have come from on, you know, it, for any of the stakeholders, any of the actors in this whole process, they may be using vastly different numbers or have a vastly different idea of what the industry standard is. Or that is. And, that was, and that was the interesting thing because I think very early on in this, I thought it's the underwriters, they, that's where it stops. They're the ones that have to act if something goes wrong. They're the ones that would be most risk averse. And when we've spoken to people, they said, well, you're the professionals, you should be telling us what what the standards are that you that you want um so it's, it's an element of i think a lot of a lot of people are waiting for for something else to shift uh to to have a, the opportunity to review their own situation and that sounds mean but it's, it's a, a very valid place to be because it, it 
there is a lot is a very complicated thing it's very difficult to to necessarily ship these things and if no one's asking you to do that then uh, it becomes uh, it becomes even more complicated uh, so I think there's there's all all kinds of reasons and every time we've spoken to someone it's there's been another kind of insight or uh, something to, to, to learn from that um, so it's yeah so it's it, and it, as I was saying before it's, it is it isn't about an individual doing something or an institution uh, not functioning in the, the optimal way but um, but a, a large kind of cultural aspect to this the professional culture aspect so would you say um... Now, I, I, this is an ongoing project, so I know you're reluctant to draw any sort of conclusions, but there is there anything that you could share in terms of uh, discoveries or surprises along the way? Or is that... I mean, one thing that, I mean, Caitlin is probably the, the best one to, um, I just can't stop talking, it seems. Um, but uh, but one, one thing is that when we, when we start talking to people, they're really interested to, to speak about it um, and they, it's been we've there's been a lot of engagement when we when we get people to, to talk um, you know people are like yeah yeah this is this is something I'd like to they have a lot to say so it's been uh, something which we felt like it was a, it was a more topical issue or a, an issue that touched more professional groups than we anticipated in there mm. um, in terms of uh, I mean, I kind of touched upon the imagined conflict. I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, about that. I was going to say that a lot of the stuff that we have just been talking about has has surfaced as common commonalities in a lot of the people we've spoken with from different kind of institutions, sizes, types, um, geographical locations. But this, as Joel, his his anecdote about the registrar and the conservator, all thinking that it was the other one who was stopping their institution from making a change that would have been beneficial to all parties. This sort of imagined conflict assumptions made about one professional culture um, from another one where communication is dropped. Um, and yeah, sort of assumptions leading to uh, stopping things before they, before they even begin. Um, but another one has been that this access to up-to-date guidance and realization that you know, people have uh, inherited past numbers and haven't really questioned them, or they do know where they're from, but uh, there's a, a, a mismatch between the lending and the borrowing organization. So they, they have accessed different guidance in different ways. Um, and then this idea, I think Joel mentioned earlier, of professional humility where someone feels like it's, this isn't really my role or my place. Perhaps it's not my place to change something that was put in place by a predecessor, or perhaps it's not my place to, to even talk about issues of environmental parameters as a registrar or as, you know, name, name the job. And, it, and that kind of comes back to something we were talking about earlier, that this, that, that kind of 70-50 is often purported to be the, the ideal conditions. And it can be ideal for different people in different ways. Some people might say it's kind of the closest we have to for a mixed collection. But then there's um, often this kind of this notion of, 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 of what that means and, and how that works. But, uh, but you're not necessarily willing to change something which is ideal in that respect. Um, no one's necessarily going to thank you for trying to, to, to change things from, from what is considered good. So I think how, how people perceive things and, and how people respond to uh, the, the, the standards, the, the pervasive elements, um, and how, you know, how it works for their specific context um, is, is something which can vary uh, in different ways as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the truly hard thing because if it's not this thing that it, we've all determined is the thing that we follow, the 70-50, then what you know what do we yeah. replace it with and and then to say well it depends is like ah <laughs> yeah but the thing is it's 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 always been a process and that's part yeah. of that was why i was kind of talking about this behavioral economics it's it's always been 
grey areas, um, but we've put our stock in, in certain numbers. Um, but there are alternative numbers that come out there. So when I was talking about AICCM, when I was talking about um, the American Institute for Conservation, they've got a kind of 40 to 60 um, kind of uh, approach there. And that was uh, embedded uh, with the Bezo Declaration um, into the IIC, IQCC um, environmental guidelines of 2014. So there are kind of, so it's, it's not necessarily that you're working in a vacuum uh, and then if in doubt, you have to go back to that. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that when that certainty doesn't necessarily come from object deterioration or risk, um, but that comes from uh, a particular time and place uh, in a particular context. So it, it may feel like we're getting into the uncertain, but we, I think to a certain extent we've always been there. Um, it's just uh, we need to, to step back and see, see what that is. Right. And I think also yeah. from an anthropological perspective, this idea of where should we be going, you can never really get there until you stop and say, well, how did we get to this point now? And so that's sort of what we're, we're trying to bring is not what should the new numbers be or what is going to make it better from where we're standing now, but to really take a step back in. And, and yeah, but to respond to your kind of uh, the frustration you are kind of expressing on behalf of, of people that um, are considering this, there is a kind of, there are, it's, it's a little bit more complex, but there are ways of, of stepping back and looking at this. Uh, and that is, partly what you're doing now. Um, so part of that is like if, if you're monitoring consumption relative humidity, understanding what, what it is in those. Uh, the danger limits have, have always been uh, the same and that kind of uh, particularly if, if it's in a temperate climate now or if it's in a, a museum which has had 50 years it's kind of set point for, for a long time. Uh, the, the danger limits kind of don't uh, for organic objects that uh, are likely to crack things like wood, then, you know, don't go too dry, don't go below 35. You know, if, if it's organic and you don't have mold, then, you know, don't go above 65 for, for very long. Don't go above 70 at all, really. Um, so those kind of, those basic things have been known for a long time. Uh, and then the other element is just to bring that to, uh, so it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's something that you don't necessarily have to do for every single object that's really for your institution. Uh, there may be different storage locations or different kind of ways in which you want to do this, different kinds of collection. Um, but it's, and it's, but it, and it is also something that we're kind of uh, working on. So with, with the ASHRAE, the, the GCI will contribute us to, to that thing. That's not the reason I was bugging it, but, um, but you know, that, that kind of, follows a, a process that starts with you know what what is the collection doing now or what is the environment around that collection doing now um and then kind of of working through that of you know what it, what is possible in your environment you know what is uh and what it what is necessary uh but and kind of responding to those two things um is is a little bit more complicated but you don't necessarily need to have a degree uh, a degree in science to, to do those things. Um, it's just the kind of the issues that we've been talking about and that's you going in and you, you know your collections best. Uh, understanding uh, that kind of, and that lived experience is something which has contributed to guidance in the past. Um, but um, so kind of to connect that in tandem with uh, the, the kind of more up-to-date research, what is possible to do uh, and what is um, kind of what is uh, reasonable to do uh, in terms of kind of leadership and sustainability? Uh, what what is that sweet spot between kind of the precision of the control you have uh, and the needs for your collection? Right. Um, so um, to sort of bring it back to you know the collections professionals that we are re mostly registrars and collections managers. Um, what do you perceive as the broader role for people in our position um, in the context of what we're doing? I mean, we can open the conversation, of course, uh, but beyond that, like, how do we um, move forward in, from our point of view? Well, I think that's a big thing, by the way. Um, what you said, said, I think that's a huge thing. I don't think that's happened very much 
we haven't seen kind of the olive branch extended to um, to registrar and collection management professionals very much in the past. Uh, but I think, I'm oh, sorry. From the conservation. Yeah, yeah. From the from the, from my world of conservation, we've been kind of talking about different numbers and the kind of. Um, but I think part of it is that I mean, registrars. A lot of people. Uh, they're the ones that see that whole process. They're the ones that are able to kind of look at the architecture. When a conservator is asked to kind of give recommendations for a loan, for example, they will be just thinking, "This is the material. This is the kind of." And then they will give their their take on this. Uh, they don't necessarily see the other parts of the process. Um, so being a, so it's actually an incredible position to be in, and one that isn't necessarily uh, visible by the curator or the exhibition manager, uh, the conservator, the conservation scientist, or the director. Um, this is um, someone who's able to, to bring that together to understand how that process works. And if you change one thing here, how it affects the other thing over there. A conservator may not necessarily, I mean, for example, we've spoken to conservators and they don't necessarily know that there's um, a default uh, set, of, set of specifications. So if you want to loan from the institution, uh, you will re receive those numbers in advance, regardless of of what it is that you want to learn. Um, so there are kind of, to know someone that understands that whole process and can see that process can convene uh, all, the, all the people that are involved in that process. Um, I think they're the, the key people to do, to do that. Uh, and while there's this stuff happening in conservation, there are this, these, these different sea changes, which um, are kind of make things a, a little bit more complicated in some ways, but um, in a, to a small extent and uh, for uh, kind of to make things easier in the in the long run um they're in a, a great position to to see that there's also that opportunity to to be to kind of interrogate that guidance of where do these sources come from where you know when when people say oh well it's the industry standard it's like well where did that industry standard come from you know what why why is it that why are you saying this for my marble statue for example um so there are kind of ways in which um, that can all contribute to addressing that professional culture that we were talking about. Right. And I think it should be mentioned as well that there are museums who, who where conservator may be aware of what's happening a few steps down the line. You know, museums are, are so different and they operate very differently. So some museums are, have really great communication or, or type communication methods, um, whereas others have just, you know, siloed professionals left in the dark about certain things. So we've heard both, you know, uh, head of conservation saying the director, we have a great relationship of trust. So if they say something that, you know, I, I disagree with, I know that they have something else going on or they explain it all to me. So I know where they're coming from. Whereas other institutions, the director says something, zero explanation. I just have to change my decision. You know, so it's, it's, very different and that can lead to a lot of um, different ways loans move. Yeah. There's also that thing of then uh, if you're if you're the gatekeeper for for learning you can start to think about how this works for you because you may not be able to say what another institution will ask of you uh, but you can start to think about what, what it is that you're willing to, to provide and some people actually come out and said for this exhibition we're doing 40-60. Um, so I hope you're I hope you're okay with that. But we're going to be quite upfront about that. Um, rather than necessarily trying to spend a lot of time and money either hitting this this environment that they're expected to do or a lot of back and forth negotiation works in this way. So different people kind of addressing these matters in different ways. Um, and that really depends on the climate. If, if you have good relationships with institutions, then there is that opportunity. And, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of you know, these things happen all the time, but a lot of it is kind of people picking up the phone and negotiating. Uh, but there can be different ways in which you can do that and to kind of examine the process and seeing at what point 
you have to pick up the phone instead of it just being something which is, is taking place. Um, uh, registrars, collections managers, they're in, they're in a great position to do that um, and to kind of, uh, and to find channels where this kind of emerging um, guidance uh, can, can reach um, so, so people can kind of consider this on their own terms. Uh, so there are lots of different... This is a perfect example of that, actually. Yeah. You know, putting the conversation out to a wider audience of, of people who are very busy and might find it difficult to read a whole bunch of articles on top of their day-to-day work. -day. I think, and maybe, I, I kind of, um, I mean, if, if guidance is something that maybe if, if people are stuck at home and they're a bit bored, uh, we could come up with a self-isolation kind of reading list of... Uh, Things, issue, issues in that respect, um, some of the guidance which is out there, some of the debates which have, have come on. Um, so if, if we can do something like that, that might be of interest to listeners. Um, I, I, I just sent some uh, a few articles and I thought they would be broad sensitive, but they were actually kind of like, oh wow, that's fantastic. Uh, my, my stuff to do today. So uh, who knows? Um, yeah. And to, to people that are listening, um, we will make uh, links and references to a lot of the uh, the documents and articles that uh, have been mentioned tonight uh, in the description of the the uh, podcast. So you can always refer back to the ARCS webpage on the podcast to get that information. So I think this is probably a, a pretty good uh, stopping point. Um, and um, if people want to find out more about the the project, where should they go? Because I'm sure people are going to want to see some some results. And yeah, yeah. Um, we would love to interview anybody who is willing. So yeah, yeah. Actually. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah. If they want to do that, how do they get in contact with you? I mean, well, uh, we can certainly give you a website. Uh, we can give you our email addresses to, to put up with the links. That would be yeah. Very What's your website? Um, and it's, uh, if, we'll send you the link, it's, um, but it's uh, www.getty.edu uh, and then there's the, the GCI, the Getty Conservation Institute. Um, so then, uh, and then you'll find our project amongst that. We also had a recent publication. Um, uh, every six months, the, the Getty Conservation Institute produces uh, a free uh, newsletter uh, with, with uh, short articles, roundtable discussions, uh, and uh, and different kinds of features. Uh, so there was one on on our initiative quite recently, uh, and that's got a fair. It doesn't talk about the the loans aspect of this, but a lot of the the surrounding the surrounding issues that uh, take place. So we can send, and that's freely available as well. Um, got it. But, uh, For but, email addresses, maybe Joel, if you give yours, because I have a really long name, so my email okay. address. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we, I mean, I can give it to you verbally now, or we can. Uh, might, might as well go ahead and say it. I think it's, uh, so it's uh, J Taylor with a Y, full lowercase at uh, Getty. Edu. Perfect. At Getty. Edu. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for contributing to this, and um, you know, we look forward to, to hearing more about it and see how things um, develop and uh, the results of some of this uh, research that you've been doing for quite a long time, I think. Um, and also, please, you know, if you're listening and you think that you have something to contribute, please reach out to them and, uh, you know, uh, more research, the better. So um, as always, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Google Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, and Spotify. Um, we want to send a big thanks to Joel and Caitlin for contributing to the, the conversation okay. tonight. And uh, until next time, uh, we'll see you shortly. Thanks for listening. Thanks.